As I said, I invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> now, the um, overall theme here that we have in this beginning of chapter 1 is the fact that Paul is thanking God for fellow believers in Christ. He is saying, God, I am so thankful for my fellow believers in Philippi. I am so thankful for what they've done for me in sharing with me, in supporting me. I am so thankful that they're moving forward in the Gospel and that we're able to strive together for the faith of the Gospel. Now you want to put yourself in Paul's sandals. You want to see that Paul is sitting in a prison cell, yet he has in his heart great rejoicing about Jesus Christ. He has great rejoicing about fellow believers in Jesus Christ and that they're working together for the faith of the Gospel. And Paul is not sitting having a pity party because of his circumstances. He's not fighting his circumstances. He's not depressed about where he is. Instead, he's walking by faith. He's seeing his God. He's seeing the fellowship he has with Jesus Christ and with others, even though they're some 600 miles away. This epistle, I trust, will bless your heart as it is blessing my heart as, we, as I am comprehending the depths of what Paul is communicating or God is communicating to us through Paul. Would you please join me as we read verses 1 through 8. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where Pastor Roxer ended last week. Verse 3, Philippians 1. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the Gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace." For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Again, Paul is writing this in his prison cell by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's writing this to believers who are about 600 miles away, the way the crow flies. But if they were to travel there, he was, it would be about 800 miles away. And what do we find here in this passage? we find fellow believers in Christ in the heart of Paul. He is saying, I give thanks to God for you, and I've hidden you right here in my heart. Now, you folks don't want to go to a prison cell, do you? But Paul takes his fellow believers there because they're in his heart and he's rejoicing. Now, what we see here, again, is an epistle that is written back to a group of people, as we saw um, through Pastor Roxer last week, as it was planted the church in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. Lydia, some ladies at a prayer meeting down by the river, a jailer with his family, and a slave girl who very well could have gotten saved after the demon was cast out of her a lowly group of individuals who were growing in grace, growing in numbers, and Paul is saying, as I sit here in this prison cell, I have you in my heart, and I'm thinking of you. Now, if you look at verse 3, you'll see here that Paul is saying he is thanking God for these fellow believers. I thank my God upon everything every remembrance of you. Now, he is expressing 
his gratitude for both the church leadership and for all the fellow believers in Christ. For up in verse 1, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. So he's including every believer in this church, singling out the congregation as saints and the leadership included. And he is saying here in one simple statement, the main verb, the main structure of this sentence we see is, I thank my God. I, the subject, verb, thank, direct object, my God. I am directing to God my thanksgiving for you. He's thanking him present, active, indicative means he's continually at this present time actively choosing, and that's a fact, to thank God for these fellow believers who are in, their, in his heart. Now he's thanking God for every memory of those fellow believers. They are not there presently in presence or physical presence with him, but they're there in his heart and he's remembering them. He's starting out this prayer directing his conversation to God that I'm thanking my God upon every remembrance of you. Now, if you've ever spent much time in jail, you know there's a lot of time on your hands, except there's getting less time at St. Louis County Jail because they have so many activities for all of the inmates. But my point is this, there's idle time. Paul is sitting there. He doesn't have a lot to do. He's all alone, and he is thinking, and he's remembering, and he's praying, and he's in fellowship with his God. And during those times, he says, I have memory of you. I have thoughts about you, and I am giving thanks to God. He is literally saying, all of my remembrance of you causes me to thank God. Now, he does not say that about any other church. Not about Corinth. They were carnal. But he says, I give thanks to God for you. Not the Galatian believers, because he launches in right away because they've been listening to false legalistic teachers into a challenge to them. But these believers... He's gotten report through Epaphroditus. He's heard information. He's spent a lot of time with them. And he says, every time I think of you, I give thanks. These memories stimulated him, exhilarated him in his thoughts about these fellow believers. So when you're thinking about this simple thanks, it's eucharisto in the Greek. It means to be thankful or to express your appreciation or gratitude. It is a response many times for receiving a blessing from another. Now, if you notice careful or you notice closely here that in the middle of this word Eucharisto, we have the word charis, which is the word for Greek, or excuse me, the Greek word for grace. And so the secondary meaning for grace is thanksgiving. And so Paul is saying, I am thinking grace towards you, and it's going towards God in expression of thanksgiving to God. He was vertically thanking God for his fellow believers in Christ, who though he couldn't see them physically, by faith and by the memory of them, he was giving thanks to God. We see this same word in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He was giving thanks actively, present tense, to my God, personally speaking to his personal God. Imagine being all alone. I know he received visitors but there's a lot of isolation time in prison. And he is enjoying his fellowship with his God. My God, he is giving thanks to for the blessing and the remembrance of these believers. Thank you, Lord. When you think about other believers far away or even close, can you give thanks for them? Yes, positionally, always. 
Sometimes not every memory is sweet with them. You might have some conflicts, or maybe you've fallen away in fellowship with them. But Paul, towards this group of believers in Philippi, he was saying, continually, my remembrance of you, give thanks. And he repeatedly responded in prayer for others, uh, in thanksgiving and prayer, in other uh, beginnings of the epistles. In Ephesians 1, he says this, I do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers. He continually gave thanks for the Ephesian believers, the Thessalonica believers. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Every remembrance of these Philippian believers gave him cause to thank God. What's interesting, if you would t turn over to chapter 4, and we'd read a little bit of the end of this epistle, we see that they had been ministering to Paul's physical needs after he had left them in Macedonia. Starting in verse 14, chapter 4, verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received all, received from Epaphroditus, the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He starts thinking of these believers, and they are striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul is on the front lines. They're back there sending reinforcement, as it were, supplies, so he could continue to move forward and serve the Lord even when he was locked up in prison. Do you know that in Myanmar, it's told me that if you go to prison and you don't have a support system outside of the prison, you will die in prison. Your relatives must come, usually give a bribe to the guard, and then they have to go in and they bring you food. Or the guards will pass it in to their relatives. If you don't have a support system in jail, in, a, in many third world countries, you will not survive. And so here he's saying, thank you for supplying my need while I am in Rome. And I imagine it maybe was in the form of money so he could buy some food or support uh, his time while he was locked up. He says in verse 14, I don't want you to miss this, nevertheless you have done well that you shared in my distress. They're supplying to him, and these weren't rich believers in Philippi, they're sharing in his distress, they're giving, they are encouraging him. And when he reflects upon that, he says, I give thanks to God when I think of you. <clears throat> now, as I was thinking, is this true about me when I think about others? I was thinking about Samuel, I was thinking about Tao and Nelson. Um, each man all these men I have been with in these foreign countries, and I thought about, you know what, I can give thanks to God. These men are going across the border into Nicaragua and preaching the gospel and furthering it, and we're helping them by supporting them. Samuel is doing the same, going into the mountains, his high blood pressure, sacrificing, putting himself out, and we're sending supplies. We can give thanks when we get these reports back. We should be praising God and saying, thank you, Lord, that we can strive with them together for the faith of the gospel. Last night I was at the uh, college-age retreat. Pete Tranvik spoke. I sh sat with Sean Laughlin for a little bit, and I thought, oh, what good remembrances I have of these men. I went to high school with them. All three of us got saved similar, went through Gibbs together. We've gone out together on missions trips. They're preaching. We're striving together. I have such a good remembrance. Thank you, Lord, for fellow servants who are, we are in bonds, in a sense, bonds to Jesus Christ, servants, serving him and giving honor and glory to the Lord and yet ministering to others. He's not self-occupied. He's giving thanks. 
Again, 600 miles away, yet he is giving thanks and he's thinking of these people. He's not all caught up with his circumstances. Do you think that the leaders and the saints in Philippi always did everything pleasing to Paul? Well, no. I don't think they did. In fact, he brings a criticism in chapter 4 to two, about two ladies. But you know what? In grace thinking, you can forgive. In grace thinking, you can rejoice with other believers because they're going to offend you and you're going to offend them. A marriage would never or will never work to the height that God wants it or the depth that God wants it without grace thinking, without forgiveness, one spouse to another, without forgiveness to the children and the children to the parents. And that home needs grace thinking. And servants of the Lord Jesus Christ need grace thinking. We see Paul appealing to them when you get to chapter 4, the Odious and Syntyche, about having the same unity of mind. So we see this gratitude, this expression of thanksgiving for the leaders and the fellow believers in Christ. He's thinking about their memory, but he's also continually praying for them. Turn with me back, please, to Philippians chapter 1. He says in verse 3 and following, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Now remember, the main subject here is I give thanks to my God. And from that, everything flows. So this is a participle here that he says, I'm always in prayer, always in every prayer of mine making requests. It's a present tense participle off of this thanksgiving. My thanksgiving to God causes me horizontally to pray for you. And as he's thinking of believers, it causes them to go to the throne of grace. <clears throat> Continually. Look at these words here. Always. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Present tense, always, every prayer. I just keep on praying for you. Now next week, in chapter 9 through 11, we're going to see the very specific prayers that Paul had for these believers in Philippi. But suffice to say right now, he was ongoing making intercession for these believers. Intercession is a request that you make at the throne of grace or your God for another. You intercede or go before the Lord for another. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful privilege that we have before the Lord to go to Him with the needs of our loved ones and fellow believers and even the lost. In James 5, we see that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we see Peter receiving prayer. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church, Acts 12.5. In Romans 10, we see Paul praying for the unsaved, the uh, believers of Israel, or the unbelievers of Israel. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Continually for Peter, continually for the unsaved. And here's what Paul did in Romans 1.9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. In Colossians 1.3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Paul was an active prayer warrior. In fact, every epistle that he writes includes prayer some type of mention or emphasis. In the book of Philippians, it is an emphasis. In the book of Colossians, it is an emphasis. He's communicating to God for his fellow believers in Christ. And again, this is an expression of his gratitude. He prays because he is so thankful for these fellow believers in Christ. Philippi. It motivated him. It propelled him. It drove him to his knees. Now, he could not go there and minister directly to them. And he writes a letter eventually, but before that, he is praying continually. 
You may have children away at school. You have, may have friends far away who have uh, some illness. You can pray specifically. You may have a relative or a friend or an associate who is unsaved. You can pray for them. I like what he says, always continually he's praying for them. His prayers were just an expression that he was interceding, or he was thankful for them, and it was shown in his interceding. Now, you and I, I think, can grow in our prayer life. Now, you're saying, are you judging me, Scott? I'm saying there's few of us, any Christians, who say they pray too much. We are oftentimes way too busy to have a deep, ongoing, laboring prayer ministry in the United States of America. Was it difficult for Paul to have this long and, ex and extended prayer ministry to the Philippians? No, not at all. In fact, what words does he use? With joy. Verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. All with joy. Joy. It's a delight in his spirit to come to God and pray for them. His gratitude, again, propelled him to go to his knees and pray for these fellow believers in the gospel. Again, he was in his prison cell. By sight, he could only see four walls. But by faith, he knew God would honor his prayers. He knew before the throne of grace, he honored Jesus Christ. And since Paul was in Christ making requests, he would honor his prayers. Now, what's interesting in this passage, and I've read the, the book through several times this week. Has anyone else read Philippians since we started it, re read it through this week several times? Good. I encourage you to do it. I see some of the men who are teaching. They're ahead of things. Good job, men. Read it. It takes you, if you're a decent reader, it takes you less than 15 minutes to read this through. If you sit and meditate and study, it'll take you a, a little bit longer. I took an hour and a half the other day. I thought about these things. I cross-referenced. I did this. What a delight. Here's what I found. Two types of joy in this. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, three, chapter 3, verse 1. The first joy I see here, and one of the keys of the book of Philippians is the joy that comes from your right thinking and your walk with Jesus Christ. And he says in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, find joy, rejoice in the Lord. That's the first type of joy. When you think about the Jesus Christ who is creator, who created this world and then he humbled himself and he died for you and me, that should be joy. When you think about we're one with Jesus Christ, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings, that nothing, no one can separate us from the love in our position in Christ, we can rejoice in the Lord always. We have everything and our life is wrapped up with Jesus Christ. That's joy. That's a delight in our spirit and our soul. Look at chapter 4, verse 1, please. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Do you know that fellow believers to believers, we have delight of spirit? He says, you're my joy. That's the two types. And it's repeated in several different places. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say, rejoice. Look at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. You see that there's this vertical rejoicing. I have a delight in the Spirit for my association and my knowledge and understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also this horizontal joy. This fellow believer joy. Look at chapter 2, verse 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out, now this is, he's talking about his service, as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. There's this fellow rejoicing both in service and in delight of each other. I can remember when I first started coming to Duluth Bible Church, one of the most delightful things for me was walking through the front door and Dave Knutson would greet me. I don't know if I would have kept coming 
But that guy would always shake my hand. If you've ever looked Dave in the eye and he shakes your hand, it's like, good to see you, Scott. I was thrilled to come and see Dave Knudsen. He was one of the only people I knew to start with for the first couple months or whatever. When you walk into church, do you delight with fellow believers? When you get together with fellow believers and they tell you stories about the gospel, or stories about the fairs, or witnessing to their relatives, or trials and they've claimed verses through, can you get a thrill in your, ver in your soul? I hope so. That's what Paul is saying. Our fellow association with Jesus Christ brings a delight in my spirit and rejoice in the Lord always. Now sometimes there's strife and division. That could be between a husband and a wife, parents and children, fellow believers in Christ. And it's hard to delight in each other at that time. But with grace and forgiveness and long-suffering and patience over time, many times those relationships can come back. And he's saying, when I think about you in this dirty, rotten, stinking, mildewy prison, I delight and I rejoice and I give thanks and I pray for you always. I hope you're walking in Paul's sandals like I have been this week. It's a great place. He's rejoicing with his fellow believers. Now let me just balance this a little bit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So I believe it's difficult to really have the true delight and joy that God wants to give us amongst each other without a vertical walk with Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of God who then puts that joy and that delight in our soul. But it can be directed again. In this passage, it shows clearly towards other believers in Christ. Now, one little question here. What magnitude of effort do you put forth in praying for others? A little bit, I pray. Sometimes I pray. Or I'm a very devoted person prayer warrior. I have an extensive prayer list of people, and I set a time aside weekly to pray for people. What could be true of you? I'll tell you, if I measured this church by the amount of people who come on Wednesday night, I would say we are not doing very well in our laboring prayer ministry. We'll have 200 plus people in this auditorium on a Wednesday night. Do you know how many people are here at 20 till? On an average? Less than 30 maybe 15 sometimes. I'm just saying this because this is a vital ministry. As Spurgeon said, it's the heating plant of the church is the prayer life of the church. Well, we're going to freeze this winter, if that's the case, if it depends upon some of us. Now, can I grow in grace and, in, and the, and the uh, prayer life that I have? Yes. In fact, I was convicted this week again. Praying to God for others makes a difference. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Samuel is saying, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. <clears throat> now, main word, main verb, I thank my God. And it's expressed in his continual prayers, participle. It's also expressed in thanking God for this fellowship that he has. Let's go back to chapter 1, please. And I'm going to start with verse 3 and read down through verse 5. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Let me just mention, I didn't mention, I forgot. You all is plural. Every one of you. And corporately, I'm praying for you all. Verse 5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Not only am I thanking God for the remembrance, but for the fellowship in the gospel. I thank God for this ongoing fellowship that we have had in the gospel. Now, what is this word fellowship? Very important to understand it. It literally is a common thinking. Koinonia. It means to think the same. Have your mind the same. So it's a common thinking. It's a communion. It's an agreement that we have. And he's saying our fellowship is in the Gospel. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. What we have in 
justification, sanctification, and glorification. This message wrapped up in Jesus Christ is what we celebrate. Now, one author put it this way in his observation of Philippians. I thought it was very interesting. It does not take much reading of Paul's letters to recognize that the gospel is the single passion of his life. That passion is the glue that in particular holds this letter together. By the gospel, especially in Philippians, Paul refers primarily neither to a body of teaching nor to the proclamation. Above all, the gospel has to do with Christ, both his person and his work. So, if this author is accurate, and I can see what his point is in this book of Philippians, it emphasizes Jesus Christ. He doesn't get into all the details of the gospel, but instead he reflects it upon his Savior, Jesus Christ. So if this is true, verse 5 could be said this, for your fellowship in Jesus Christ from the first day until now. That gospel is not defined here. It's simply the fact that our fellowship is around Jesus Christ. And what it is, it's an unbroken fellowship, a long-time fellowship. It's a close relationship from the first time or first day until now. Paul is reflecting back upon the time he went, came into town and he met Lydia. And he had that prayer meeting down by the river in Acts chapter 16. He remembers getting thrown into jail from these false accusations and casting out this demon from this slave girl. He remembers from that first day until now, we've been in fellowship and having common mind, common purpose, common thought. We're having fellowship around our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you this. Upon what basis is your passionate fellowship centered? Now, when do you get revved up in delight for soul with other people? Is it around the Vikings? We've got a winning streak going, yes! One game, if any of you didn't know. They won last week. The losers, though, didn't win last week. Oh, the Packers, yeah. <laughs> now, again, it's just a little jesting. Don't get out of fellowship because I don't exalt the Packers, please. My point is this. My point is this. The fellowship, you get revved up and you delight and you start talking statistics, you start talking facts, you start talking players, you talk about the playoffs, you talk about last year, you talk and you're spirit and you're revved and you're thinking the same and you're having fellowship. That's horizontal. And that's not sin. I do it about hunting, I do it about fishing, I do it about gardening, I do it about other things. But is that our primary fellowship? Can you come to this church and not talk about horizontal things, but instead focus on Jesus Christ? And I'm not being legalistic and saying every time you talk about the Vikings or cars or sports or rummage sales or golfing, you're out of fellowship. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, where is your delight of common ground here at church. Is it grandchildren? Oh, my grandbaby did this. You want to see the picture? And I'll show you my YouTube or my, my uh, iPhone. It's around Jesus Christ. That's what brings us together here. And that's what Paul's saying. We're 600 miles away, and when I think about you, I rejoice that we have fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now. Now, I was thinking about this message that I was sitting listening to Peter Tranvik last night. Peter Tranvik and I got saved in the same era, about a year apart or so. I'm riding a bus from downtown Duluth. That was before I had a car. I was biking around the town. Peter was a college student. He was on the bus. And I was on the front of the bus. He was on the back of the bus. And at the end of the bus trip, which was Kirby Student Center, he comes up and he says, Hey, Scott. Oh, hey, Pete, how's it going? Hadn't seen him in a while. Comes up and he says, hey, um, I heard that uh, you kind of got religious. This gal, common gal that we knew, her name was Chris, she had told Peter to go talk to Scott because she had been witnessing to him. So he came up to me and he started talking to me, talked to him, invited him to come to church. Uh, he started coming out. Sean Laughlin uh, came along and the two of them then came out and all three of us were saved in a very short period of time. From that time... We've had fellowship in the gospel. We played intramural sports 
together. I played uh, Little League Baseball with Sean Laughlin. We don't go back and say, oh, you remember those days we played baseball together? Pete, do you remember when we beat you in, uh, in broom ball? No. Our common, we did. We did beat them. <laughs> we lost in the championships, but we beat them. And I won't tell you their name of their team. It's embarrassing, but you can ask them when you see them. Our fellowship doesn't go back that first day from our intramural sports together or our little league. It goes back to the gospel. The relationships that we build. Now, family is one thing. You hold together with family, as my father-in-law says. Familia. You hold together there, but what's bigger and greater than all of that is Jesus Christ, our spiritual familia. And we're brethren, we're beloved, and we delight in our Savior, we delight in each other, we strive together for the faith of the gospel, and he's saying, I delight. I delight and I give thanks for your fellowship, our common thinking, our common agreement, our common purpose in the gospel from the first day until now. You can see him. Probably tears coming down his eyes as he reflects upon all the relationship that he has with these believers in Christ and in Philippi, and they sent money to him and supported him, and they're going through trials and persecution, and he is too, and they're moving forward. Again, it's not just a horizontal thing. It's a vertical thing. Now really, what brings fellowship between two believers or within a local church? You know what does that? Sound Biblical doctrine. You cannot think together. You cannot work together without common, sound doctrine. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. I praise God and thank Him that we are in a local church that teaches the Word week after week after week after week. And we have the opportunity to pick it up and be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And as we move together, that brings us closer together. Not just the horizontal things. Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? As we learn the Word of God together and we say amen, we have fellowship. And the deeper our understanding is of the truths of the Word of God and the more we have amens together, the more fellowship and delight of soul we have together. Psalm 133.1 Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in fellowship, in unity. Oh, that sweet fellowship. There are certain individuals who are just passionate about fair ministry. And when they're involved with this and they go away or somewhere, I look for opportunities to corner them in the hallway and say, so tell me a story about what happened back there. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Stories from Texas. Or I, told, I always tell Samuel, now don't give me an outline. Tell me some stories. He just got back from the northern part of the country and he said, I'm just back in town. I'll sell you, send you a long letter like I know you like to hear. I want to be there amening with him. I'm back here on my knees praying. I'm back on my mirrors here laboring. And I'm thinking, what's going on there? How's his blood pressure? Are they, are they getting opposition? Are the people responding? And so we want to have that fellowship or common agreement. And so it's a delight in the Spirit. And so we've seen here that he has a thanksgiving to his God for these believers. He continually prays for them. He is in fellowship with them from the very first day until now. And he also thanks God for his continual transformation work in his fellow believers. He thanks God for his continual transformation work in these fellow believers. I'm going to start with verse 3 and read down through verse 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is saying, I have confidence. What kind of confidence? 
Not confidence that you're going to stand before the Lord perfect. That's a given. He says up there in verse 1, saints. They're already sanctified, seated in the heavenlies with Christ. They are set with Him, one in Christ, never to change in position. What he's saying is, I'm thankful for this transformation work that is happening here in second tense salvation. That God is continually working in you and through you, how long? Until the day of Jesus Christ. So if we have the rapture right here, if we don't die, that's what I'm saying, but instead we're raptured. If we're raptured, that's the day of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the day of the Lord in the Old Testament was the coming judgment upon those who were rebelling against the Lord. Sometimes it was God's people in the Old Testament, and the day of the Lord that we're looking forward to is the... Um, seven-year tribulation period, and the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the day of Christ. We're looking for the uptaking, the delightful time that the rapture comes and we'll be with the Lord and with, be with the saints. But in this time, I trust that my God has a continual transformation work in my fellow believers. He says, being confident. This is a perfect, active participle. He's absolutely certain from that point forward, God is working in you. He's completing what he started. Being confident. He is absolutely assured of this very thing, that he who has begun a work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. He has a confident assurance of God's work continual transformation work. He, God, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it, bring it to perfection until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, this transformation work, again, is something that God is doing within us. And why is this possible? Turn with me to chapter 2, verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved, chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. With his new nature, he's giving us a desire to do his will. With the Holy Spirit, he's giving us the ability to do his good will. And Paul is confident that God will continue to do his part in the soul of these believers in Philippi. Now, is that without our uh, involvement? Absolutely not. We have a free volition, and that's what verse 12 was saying. You have obeyed, not only in my absence, but right now, and work out your own second tense salvation here. Work out your sanctification with fear and trembling. So, he is referring not to their justification, which a Calvinist will take chapter 1, verse 6, and they'll say, see, the perseverance of the saints, because it's God who works in you, and every true believer will persevere to the very end. I went to sermon audio, and I was listening to some messages, just for the fun of it, as I was traveling, and I found that most of the Calvinistic messages on this passage, they just exalt. This is the perseverance of the saints. We know absolutely that you will persevere. And so if you are elect and God has given you the gift of faith, you will persevere because God will continue his work till the day of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that's what it's saying. I believe what he's teaching is it's a sanctification issue and God is working in you and we're fellowshipping in the gospel and I am thrilled about this. Now he also says in this passage, <clears throat> well, um, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Our responsibility to keep on beholding God's glory in the Word of God and the Spirit of God transforms us. He was confident, but he also says, we will continue, God will continue his work until Jesus Christ raptures the church. As I alluded to already, he says in verse 6, he will uh, complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
this day of Jesus Christ is again starts with the rapture. That's when Christ comes back to snatch us out of here and then we'll be up there and he will reward us. He'll evaluate us at the judgment seat of Christ. We will have the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're looking forward to that. But until that happens and Jesus Christ comes back for his bride, he's working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. His spirit is undertaking and giving us empowerment and teaching us and leading us and such. <clears throat> Now, when did God begin this work? It's at the point of salvation. From the very first, he begun a good work in you. When someone trusts Jesus Christ, we can say that's the point where God directly works. Though he is drawing individuals, though in eternity past, he knows who is going to be saved. And God is continually working in us. But here, specifically, I would say, from the day of salvation... Your sanctification is then started, and that's what he's referring to up until the day of Jesus Christ. And he's rejoicing that they're having fellowship, and until that day of the rapture. Now, he is again expressing an adoration for these believers. He has been thanking God. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer, for the fellowship that we have, for the confidence that I have that God is going to complete his work in you until the day of Christ. And then he's going to say, verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now, since time doesn't permit, and I'm teaching next week, I'll elaborate on this along with the prayer. But the point is this, is Paul is separated from these fellow believers, and he is thinking of them, and he's saying, I have you in my heart. I'm thanking God for you. You are partakers of this grace and this struggle and this trial that I'm having here because you're giving money and you're praying for me and I'm praying for you and you are close, and he says in verse, uh, you, we, you are close to me, and he says in verse 8, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And we'll see the details of that, but literally, the bowels of Jesus Christ, the passion and the love that is of Jesus Christ, that's how I want to see you and be with you and strive together with you. I pray that that could be more and more a growing reality in each of us. Would we pray together, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you, Heavenly Father, even for this epistle of uh, Philippians. Thank you that Paul was for a time in prison. He had this opportunity to write this letter. And thank you, Father, for the tenderness that he demonstrates towards fellow believers and the deep conviction that he has towards them. Father, pray that this thankfulness, this love, this striving together, this adoration could be more and more a reality in our hearts towards our Savior and towards one another. So we thank you now. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.